But you, you mentioned that there was this chip right. that had been added in by the military, and it was it found in a lot of products. Can you this, explain this that? This is a Business Week story. Uh, many of my colleagues from Business Week are here. Uh, they it started when Amazon wanted to buy a company in Oregon that made software that was able to to analyze large video feeds. You can imagine it has military implications as as well as any uh, impl implication. And so they were using uh, servers made by Supermicro in California. So Amazon uh, bought one of these servers and had it analyzed. They had it sent to uh, Ontario, where they, a firm took it apart and bit by bit by bit and compared it to the schematic, the diagram, that the specifications, the original specifications. And they found a chip the size of a grain of sand that had been installed in these uh, the super micro servers were sourced from China. So the, the PLA had figured out where the servers were made and gone to the factories and had, had, had forced, obliged the manufacturers to insert these tiny chips into the uh, motherboards. And these, motherboard, these chips gave the, the PLA the power to take over control of the motherboard mm -hmm. if such a, a time would come. There was no evidence that they actually took control, but that they were preparing to. Mm -hmm. So these, these devices made by Supermicro were in use in the U.S. Navy, both houses of Congress, uh, Amazon, uh, Apple. Apple uses them. So, uh, so there, there's been, uh, it's never been proven, and only Business Week reported it. Having worked there for 11 years, I don't think the Business Week could have made that up. Mm -hmm. It's too wild to be just made up. I, I think there's, I think that the Chinese have surprised the American experts I talked to about the level of sophistication that they're displaying in information communication technology. They're just, they have, they have moved ahead rapidly. Um, you, know, you bring up an interesting issue of, of also, you know, with regard to Chinese scientists at American universities and government. You know, are we in danger of starting some sort of new red scare where you know, Chinese nationals or ethnic Chinese well, become suspect. There are four million Chinese Americans, so mm. that, that's that's one of the most sensitive aspects of this whole subject. Is how can we uh, attack the these abuses that are clearly occurring without turning it into a red scare or anti-Chinese vendetta? Uh, my my answer is that there are many Chinese Americans who understand the pattern of what's happening better than we can and can identify it and and flag it so that we can stop the penetrations before they disclose uh, sensitive information or before uh, the cat gets out of the hat. One example is Chinese Americans working for American news organizations. They've been very, very smart and they understand the pattern better than we do. So Amy Chin, writing for the New York Times, is, was the first one who explained about the Chinese government blackballing Hollywood studios who used mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Brad Pitt, because Brad Pitt made mm -hmm. the movie Seven Years in Tibet. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was Li Yuan of the now New York Times who has written so persuasively about Huawei and why they are, in fact, a threat to our, our national security. So if we can persuade Chinese Americans uh, to become part of an effort to check these abuses, then that's a win-win. That's, that's a positive strategy. Mm. But, you know, what, what about the way the system is? I mean, so many um, graduate students in the STEM field are ethnic Chinese or Chinese nationals. Are we bringing in too many Chinese students? And, you know, should our tax-exempt, you, you know, institutions of higher learning be educating Chinese nationals? I mean, this, 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 is, this is a very sensitive issue. Right. I, mean, I mean, there's a lawsuit pending in Harvard saying Harvard discriminated against Asian Americans so, uh, because there are too many of them. So uh, I, I draw a distinction between an Asian American and a Chinese national. I think that we can gradually uh, embrace the different sets of policies for people who are foreign citizens as opposed to people who are American citizens. But it's extremely delicate, extremely uh, sensitive, because the Asia Pacific, the Asian American political caucus in Washington, who wouldn't even talk to me for this book, they're 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 sure just to to say that any movement in that direction represents a direct assault 
on all Asian Americans. Well, there are, there are also many Chinese nationals in the United States and Canada who feel threatened right. by the Chinese government. And you mentioned this in your book, people like Rose Tang, who spoke here right. a few weeks ago, right. um, people who participated in the 1989 democracy movement. There's a kind of war going on all these 30 years after Tiananmen. The Chinese government is still pursuing uh, these people who survived and denying them contact with their families in China, uh, harassing them, their communications, approaching them with agents. Uh, and we flew Wu or Kai Shi from Taiwan here for this event a month ago. He could not fly on a Chinese na national airline because he's black blacklisted. He had to fly mm -hmm. on a Taiwan airline to get here. So the Chinese government is engaged in a a, a kind of war here on our soil against these, these survivors.